Welcome back to New York City, everybody watching theCUBE's coverage of MongoDB World 2022. My name is Dave Vellante. Pretty good attendance here. I'd say over 3,000 people, great buzz, a lot of really technical sessions. There's, there's an executive session going on, there's a financial analyst, so a lot of diversity in this, uh, in this attendee base. Vadim Supitsky is here, he's the CTO of Forbes, and Abdul Razak is the Vice President of Solution Engineering at Google. Gents, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks, Dave. Okay, good to be here. So, Forbes, very interesting business. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in what, what occurred during the pandemic for you guys, right? Everybody went digital. Obviously, you guys have a tremendous brand. Uh, we all, well, we all in the business world read Forbes, <laughs> but what happened during the, 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 the isolation era? What happened to your business? Yeah, so we've been innovating and going through digital transformation for years, since we launched our website probably 25 years ago. Right. But during the pandemic, because of our coverage, our foresight to create a breaking news team, our audiences and readership really skyrocketed. Really? Yeah, and at that point, we were very happy and really lucky to be in Google Cloud and MongoDB Atlas. So, when the audiences went up, we didn't feel any impact, right? Our, our environments are scaled, and uh, our users didn't experience any issues at all. So we were able to focus on innovation, our users' loyalty, and really building cool products. So we, that we were very lucky and happy to be in Google Cloud and MongoDB Atlas so, at that point. So Abdul, the solution <laughs> your title you provided obviously, obviously worked. What, how did you guys end up getting together? What was that, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, like, like uh, Vladim said, right? I mean, um, maybe there's a little bit of a right place at the right time uh -huh. in, this, in this case, but you can see the, the, the need for digital transformation um, and the pandemic really accelerated that. And I mean, like, like Nadim said, primarily Forbes wanted to focus on innovation and customer loyalty, and, and the way that comes to bear is you know, that you have a technology platform that can serve those needs, right? Uh, whether it is through unique applications uh, that can be delivered, the, the ability for developers to build those applications quickly and seamlessly, and then remove the, the, the intangibles of you know, scalability, performance, latency, and things of that nature. So uh, you, know, this, you, know, you can see this all coming together in, in, in this scenario. So as, as consumers, we see the website, we, right. we read, uh, online, uh, maybe sometimes in the laptop, mostly on mobile. Um, what is it that we don't see? I mean, <laughs> the apps you know, that Abdul talked about, uh, the community, what, what else is there? Paint a picture of that for us. Yeah, there is a lot going on behind the scene, right? So focusing on audience, building communities, but also what uh, it allowed us to do while everything was working well, we were scaling up, right? We were able to focus on a lot of innovation. Mm -hmm. And one of those was first party data platform that we built, we call it Forbes One. And that's in the center of everything that we do at Forbes right now, right? So it allows us, one, to connect our partners, advertising partners, with the audiences that they're looking to engage and um, to connect with. And then we are growing a consumer business as well. And what that allows us to do is target the right products mm -hmm. at the right time to the right people on the web website and off the main. So that's just one of the examples that we've built our full first party data platform on these technologies. And we now know our customers so well that we're able to provide them with what they want. So the first party data platform is what, a self-serve for advertisers so they can identify? Not just advertisers, so it's in the center of everything. So advertiser comes in, we provide the segments and users that they want to reach. Now, we are creating products as well, building, building cool, innovating products and uh, offering our journalism and everything there to our readers and we're able to connect them to the right audiences at the right time. As well as personalization, right? You come into the website, you want to read what you want to read. So we're able to create that as well using machine learning and AI. So a product might, it might be a data product or might be a It could be a data product. product. Um, it could be like just personalization or something mm -hmm. like that. It could be a newsletter, right? It could be a standalone product, uh, like investing product. So there is a lot going on there, but we, we want to offer the right ones at the right time to the right audiences. And building that platform has allowed us to do that. Okay, now Google's got great tech, 
What's the tech behind all this? Yeah, so when, when Vadim talked about you know, segmenting, you know, to personalize something that is relevant to you and providing recommendations to you, right? And that all that is based on machine learning AI technology. The fact that you know, Vadim has all the, all the data curated in a, in a first party data platform gives, gives the ability to you know, create a seamless profile, right? You could be interested in you know, a couple of products, right? And then the, the, the underlying technology can tailor that to, to, to bring, you know, what is it that you're looking for at the right place at the right time, right? So the, those are recommendations, things of that nature, that's all powered by, you know, AI and machine learning technology. So it's running on Mongo, and then you're bringing in Google AI and machine intelligence tools. Can you yeah, double yeah. click on that? Yeah, it's basically a combination of both. Mm -hmm. Using both platform to the fullest, and uh, we embrace cloud, Right, so we're using all the cloud native technologies, right? We didn't want to just lift and shift. Yeah. We wanted to make sure that we do it right. Yeah. And uh, we focused on animation. Even if we had to take a step back, we knew that automating things was a key for us. So yes, it's, it's been really successful, but also really informative for us to use the right tools for the job. And you had ex prior experience with Mongo, or? Uh, we did. What's your, we what's your journey been like there? Yeah. We actually were one of the first clients of Mongo. I think we were number 11 at the time. Ten Gen. Oh, wow. yeah, <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, we remember. <laughs> many years ago, it was uh, Mongo DB, Mongo DB1, right? Yeah. Um, and at that time, we, we introduced contributor network for us, and our audiences were scaling as well. And we used uh, out of the box WordPress as our publishing platform, which couldn't scale. Mm. So we had to rethink and figure out, all right, so what do we do? We compared a couple of NoSQL databases and Mongo was a winner because it checked all the boxes and uh, developers loved it right away, right? They're like, all right, this is so much faster to develop on. Um, it's just a great tool for the job going, back, going from SQL to, to NoSQL. And we scaled and we never looked back. Yeah. And then obviously Atlas came. So there are kind of two inflection points here. One, switching to NoSQL and two, going away from managing databases. Like, we don't want to be in that business, right? Updates, patches, all of that that we had to do manually, uh, over-provisioning our environments, and kind of wasteful. So, being in Atlas, that was a second kind of inflection point for us, which opened it up for us to do even more innovation and move faster. Okay, and you're happy about, about this partnership, despite, I mean, you, partner with Mongo, obviously. Yeah. Google has its own databases, but you know, this is the nature of the world we live in, isn't it? No, and, and fundamentally, like that's, we, we always believe that customer choice is the primary uh, notion, right? I mean, and, and Google Cloud Platform is more of a platform, and an and, and ecosystem is, is critical to that, right? It's, it's imperative. So, you know, like Vadim said, the, the combination of Google and Mongo provides a truly cloud native platform that can you know, serve the needs for years to come rather than you know, from looking at it from a legacy perspective. And that's the way we look at it, right? I mean, there is, uh, there is choices all the time and um, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's competition. Right? And yeah, yeah, and you're still selling a lot of compute and storage yeah. and machine yeah. intelligence, yeah. so <laughs> machine learning. This morning in the keynotes, we heard a lot about uh, a lot of different capabilities. I've, we've certainly watched Mongo evolve its platform over the last you know, half a decade or more, really. And you mentioned the developers loved it, yeah. right? As Mongo evolves its platform, are they, is there a trade-off from a developer simplicity standpoint? Or are they able to preserve that from your perspective? I think with Atlas, it actually makes it easier now. Mm -hmm. So when they need to create an environment, they can do it on the fly. When they need to test something, also things are available to them right away. So it actually, in general, as platform becomes more mature and more stable, which is very important, but at the same time, the flexibility remains for development and for creation of environments and things like that. So we've been pretty happy with, with how it uh, transitioned to being more mature platform. Did the move to Google Cloud and Atlas uh, change the way that you're able to deliver high availability uh, versus what you were doing you know, when you were self-managing? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. We were in a data center, so kind of one location and uh, 
moving to MongoDB Atlas and Google Cloud, now we multi-region, right? Yeah. So we have a full DR strategy and we feel a lot more secure and we feel very confident that anything that happens we can scale, we can fail lower. So absolutely, this helps us a lot. And uh, the feature that was introduced probably a few years ago to auto scale yeah. MongoDB environments as well, that has been really key for us. So we can sleep sleep, uh, <laughs> sleep well. <laughs> Meaning you can scale while you're asleep. Right, exactly, <laughs> right. exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, plus the other part is you don't size for peak, right? You size right. as you grow and then you, you have that elasticity right. Uh, right. built in, right? That it is native and then you know, Mongo is available on you know multiple Google Cloud regions. So as as you expand, uh, you know you don't worry about you know all the plumbing that you need to do and things of that nature. They asked uh, serverless uh, this morning. Yeah. Um, how does that affect what you guys are doing and together? And what, what are your thoughts from Google's perspective? And then, of course, for I mean, yeah, I mean, and and that's the trend that that uh, that we see constantly, right? Serverless really. Uh, decouples, uh, you know, the, the the tie to the VMs, right? And so it makes it it makes it much more easier to provide the elasticity um, and have function calls across, right? Function as a service mm -hmm. and things of that nature, right? So we see a lot of promise in that, right? We we do that even in, within our own products, and and we see uh, that giving the ability to to decompose and and recompose applications and and. Uh, would love to hear how you're leveraging yeah, that. Yeah, right? we fully embrace serverless. So we use all the tools you provide, I yeah. think. Uh, if you look at, at our architectural diagrams, there's yeah. like all these uh, pops up, yeah. cloud functions, composer, okay. app engine. Yeah. So we use the full suite and we love it. Yeah, yeah, okay. and you yeah. talked this morning about the eliminating the tr trade-offs with serverless of having to, right. you know, either when you dial it down, yeah. you have to restart, but you've, so you've solved that problem, or I guess Mongo's helped you solve that problem. Can you explain that a little bit from a technical standpoint? Yeah, from, from a technical standpoint, if you look at, like, a, as a developer, right, the, the you know, if, you, if you're building an intelligent app, it has multiple components within it, right? There is pops up for messaging, there is cloud functions, and and things of that nature. So you don't worry about, you know, with, with, with when it's encompassed in, a, in a, a serverless architecture, you don't worry about a lot of the complexities that go on behind it. And, and so that makes the abstraction much more easier and it, it eliminates the friction that a developer goes through uh, I think they've talked about yeah. you know removing friction, and and that's the primary source of productivity lo loss, right? Which is the friction. Um, you know, we used to come from a world where developers were more worried. Of, Eighty percent of the time, they would spend on, you know, plumbing this thing, and then only twenty percent uh, writing code, writing code yeah. right? <laughs> and then now the, the this it's whole flipped. paradigm should flip that, right? That's where we see the the, the promise of it. Do you still do stuff on prem? Or are you pretty much all in the cloud? Full in the cloud. How long did that cloud. take? What uh, was that like? It actually was really fast. We had a really aggressive timeline. It took us six months. Really? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was it was aggressive, but I was happy that we, <laughs> we did it in a short period of and, time. And what was the business impact uh, that you saw of moving to the Google Cloud? Yeah, so obviously after we moved to the cloud, we wanted to measure, especially the first year, how it affected us and what were the positives out of it. And yeah, we've seen tremendous results. 58% increase in speed to market. Yeah. We were releasing four times more often than when we were on-prem. Um, we saw 73% increase in uh, initiatives delivered. And while we were, our velocity was scaling up, we also saw 20% decrease in hot fixes and rollbacks. So it became more stable while we scaling up the velocity and obviously very happy with those results. Wow, do you golf? <laughs> I don't no, no, actually. No. No. Do you golf? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I watch <laughs> golf. I used to watch. Okay. Do you know what a mulligan is? Yeah. Okay. A mulligan is like a do-over, right? Yeah, if you yeah, had yeah. a mulligan, would you do anything differently? You know, like we learned a lot, um, and one of the keys for me was they definitely automate everything. Yeah. Make sure that you automate as much as possible, even if it slows you down, because in the future that will help you so much. And use the platform and the tools that are available to you. So serverless, right? Use cloud the way it's supposed to be, as much as possible. And I think that's the advice I would give. Are, 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 there, th are there any cautions with regard to uh, automation, either of you that you see? And because sometimes you, automation brings unintended consequences. Yeah. And 
and, and you know, oops happens really <laughs> fast. And yeah, and it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a process, right? If you take a step back, right? And uh, uh, typically what people tend to do is th there is a standardization process and once it's standardized, the next step is, you know, you gain efficiencies by automation, right? Mm -hmm. In this whole thing, what is underestimated is change management. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know we we see a lot of uh, we see a lot of r uh, room for improvement around educating on change management, getting ahead of that, um, so that you can see what is coming. So you know so that the organization moves across that. I don't know if you saw that in your case, but but we see this predominantly in, in other other cases. Yeah, I mean, for us, we wanted to make sure that all the testing was in place and things like that. So not just automation of. Uh, deploying or anything like that, but make sure that there is something there to catch if something goes right. wrong and roll back and things like that. So you want to make sure that you protect it in, in many areas. So square this circle for me, because it, it, especially with COVID, so many unknowns, mm -hmm. right? And one of the benefits of document database is you're not tied into a schema. You got a flexible a table, schema, exactly. okay? Yeah. So you're changing <laughs> things, you can change things much more easily. So when you talk about standardization, you're talking about standardizing what at the infrastructure layer, or what, where where is that standardization occur? Where should it occur? A standard, I mean, in in any you could you could have it at the business process level. Okay. You could have it at the at the infrastructure level. Mm -hmm. You could also have it on the administration aspect of it. So there are three areas where where you could apply automation to. So is there an analog to flexible schema at the business process level? Is that kind of how to think about it, or whereas I'm not locked into a business process schema, I have to build flexibility into that as I change my No, I mean, you, you, you know, the, the, you can apply it any which way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think the schema matters so much, right? Uh, like for example, if you take the Forbes use case, right? There are, there are, there are there is content curation, for example, right? Yeah, you could okay. take content curation, Content curation in the previous world, like in the WordPress world, was not wo very flexible, right? Like that, it wouldn't scale. And now you are in a, in a world where you you have you know you have a very flexible schema, but the process of curating the content can be sta standardized, right? And then the next step of that is to automate that, right? And so you could apply it in, in any any manner, if you will. So have you built a custom CMS? Is that yeah, what you've done? we yeah. build our own custom CMS. It's uh, AI powered. Uh, we want to make our journalist lives easier. Yeah. So we're constantly trying to figure out like what can we give them to to, day, to make their day to day job much easier. So the so machines can can curate and find the best content. We do recommend things, yes, absolutely. We curate, the, we, we tell them like what would be the best headline, for example. Um, what would... Uh, Prior to them publishing. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. would be the better keywords to include and things like that, what yeah. images, it, just recommendation. It's and you can a, automate yeah, the insertion yeah, of those, exactly. you know, WordPress, they go, you know, every time they do <laughs> yeah, it, they're, yeah, right. you know, they're writing about the same <laughs> yeah. topic. It's okay. a recommendation it's process, recommendation. obviously, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. There is a human intelligence to that yeah. at the end, right? I mean, and but, but you, you can create a much more informed view by curating and recommending content rather than a myopic uh, view. Of and you're eliminating that mundane Correct. keystroke task. Correct. So Correct. yeah, wow, amazing story guys. Thanks so much for sharing. Absolutely, Dave, sure. thank you. All right, keep it right there. We're live from MongoDB World 2022 in New York City. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm.